Hi there, I'm Jeremy Cross. Let's imagine that instead of carrying out a chemical reaction, that instead we're making grilled cheese sandwiches. Now, if you're trying to make a grilled cheese sandwich, this is, generally speaking, the recipe or the equation that you would uh, use to make that sandwich. You'd have two slices of bread and one slice of cheese. And when you put those together, you're going to make one grilled cheese sandwich. So that's uh, the uh, the ratio or the equation for carrying out this process. Now let's imagine that you're trying to make sandwiches. If you start with 50 slices of bread and 50 slices of cheese, how many sandwiches can we make? Well, those of you who've had some experience with this know that you aren't going to make 50 sandwiches, are you? You're only going to make 25 sandwiches. And why is that the case? Well, even though we do have enough slices of cheese to make 50 sandwiches. Since you have to have two slices of bread to make a sandwich, we only have enough bread to make half that many, or 25 sandwiches. And so, since we are going to carry out this process and use the bread and the cheese, if you start carrying out this process, you find that you run out of bread. And since you run out of bread first, we would call that our limiting reactant. So in, in chemistry, whenever you have two or more reactants that you're trying to react, the one that runs out first is called the limiting reactant. That's the one that basically causes the process to, to stop for all practical purposes. Now, after you've made your 25 sandwiches, you're gonna have a bunch of cheese left over. Well, since you have excess cheese, we call that the excess reactant. So once again, the reactant that's consumed first, or the one that produces less product, we call that the limiting reactant. And then the reactant that's left over at the end of the process, that's called the excess reactant. So we're gonna do a couple problems here where we're looking at the fact that there are two reactants and one of them is gonna run out first. That's the limiting reactant. So what we're going to start with here is a problem. Here we have lithium metal and sulfur flowers that can be reacted to produce lithium sulfide. And there we have the, uh, the equation for that. If 0 0.906 grams of lithium are reacted with 2.79 grams of sulfur, how many grams of lithium sulfide can we expect to produce? Which of the reactants is the limiting reactant and which one is the excess reactant? So as we always have to do in a reaction stoichiometry problem, we have to balance the equation first. So there we go, now we have a balanced equation. And what we have to recognize is in this problem, we actually have two quantities given to us. These are both quantities of reactants. So we have to write down both of those. We're gonna take the 0 0.906 grams of lithium and write that down right along with the 2.79 grams of sulfur. Now, the question is asking, how many grams of lithium sulfide can we produce? So at the end here, I'm gonna put lithium sulfide, grams of lithium sulfide, and what we're gonna do is go through our three-step process both times. And we're gonna figure out how many grams of lithium sulfide we could get based on each of these reactant quantities. And then we'll have two answers. Well, the answer that's correct is going to be the smaller of those two answers because the limiting reactant is the one that controls how much product you make and that's the one that produces the least amount of product. So we're gonna start with the 0.906 grams of lithium. Our first step, just like it always is in a reaction stoichiometry problem, is to convert to moles. So I'm gonna have to put grams on the bottom and one mole, of, uh, one mole on top. And how many grams are in one mole of lithium? Well, the periodic table here tells us it's 6.94. So I'm going to use that, that's its atomic mass. So grams are out. And now we're in moles of lithium. Step two is the mole ratio. So I'm going to have to put lithium on the bottom and lithium sulfide on the top. And for the mole ratio, I have to refer to the balanced equation to get the numbers. This is an eight to 16 mole ratio based on the coefficients of those substances. So eight to 16, lithium is out. Now I'm in moles of lithium sulfide. I wanna be in grams 
of lithium sulfide. So in my last step, I'm going to put one mole on bottom and grams on top so I can convert to that final unit of grams. And how many grams are in a mole of lithium sulfide? Well, add up those atomic masses on the periodic table. Its molar mass is about 45.94 grams in one mole. So now I can cancel moles top and bottom. And on my calculator, I take 0 0.906 divided by 6.94 times 8 divided by 16 times 45.94. And the answer I'm getting is about 3.00 grams of lithium sulfide. Now I have to do this process again to get the smaller of the two answers here. So let's try the next one. So once again, I have to convert to moles as my first step. So grams on bottom, one mole on top. And according to the periodic table, how many grams are in one mole of S8? Well, that would be about 256. 0.48 grams in a mole. So I can cancel grams and go on to step two, which is the mole ratio. So uh, S8 is the substance that goes on the bottom. I'm converting to lithium sulfide, so that goes on the top. And looking at the coefficients, this seems to be an 8 to 1 mole ratio. So 8 to 1 goes into that mole ratio. S8 will cancel and I want to convert to grams, so I have to do that last step here. So one mole on the bottom and grams on top. And once again, the number of grams in one mole of lithium sulfide is 45.94. So now I can cancel moles and do the math here. Take the 2.79, divide by 256.48, times 8, times 45.94, and my answer is 4.00 grams. Now, we have two answers here. Which one is the correct one? Well, it's the smaller one, isn't it? So the answer is 3.00 grams of lithium sulfide. So that's the answer. Now, which of the reactants is the limiting reactant? Well, it's the reactant that produces the smaller amount. So that means that the lithium, since that produced the smaller amount, the lithium is going to run out first. That's the limiting reactant. Now, which one is the excess reactant? That's asked all, uh, as well in the problem. Well, it's the other one. It's the one that doesn't run out first. So that would be the sulfur in this case. S8 would be our excess reactant. So that's how you solve a limiting reactant problem. You have to do the three-step stoichiometry process twice and then select the smaller of the two answers that you get. Now, one of the question went a step further and said, okay, in the previous problem, how much of the excess reactant was left unreacted? So that's an important problem to be able to do. Now, if we flip back to the problem that we just looked at, you'll see that the limiting reactant was lithium. That means that in the problem, we actually used up all 0.906 grams of that lithium. So what I can do is I can take that 0.906 grams of lithium and I can carry out another stoichiometry process to find out how many grams of the sulfur we actually used. So this is how much we actually used. We're going to figure out how many grams of the sulfur we used as well. So that requires another stoichiometry process. So I'm going to take uh, grams and put that on the bottom and one mole on top so I can convert to moles. And once again, the atomic mass of lithium is 6.94. So that's how many grams are in a mole of that. Grams are out. Now I can do my uh, mole ratio. So lithium on the bottom, sulfur on the top. And this is a 1 to 16 mole ratio according to the coefficients. So lithium is out. I'm in moles of sulfur. So I want to convert to grams of sulfur. So one mole on the bottom, grams on top. And if I add that up on the periodic table, it's about 256.48 grams in one mole of sulfur. So now I can cancel moles. And when I do the math on here, 0.906 divided by 6.94 divided by 16 times 256.48, I find that I'm actually going to use 2.09 grams of sulfur. Now in the last problem, it said that I had 2.79 grams available to me. And if I use 2.09 grams, 
all I have to do is subtract and I can figure out how much is left over. It's like if I have 10 apples and I eat three of them, how many are left? Well, I just have to subtract. It's the same thing here. When I subtract the amount I started with minus the amount I used up, I find that I'm left over with 0 0.70 grams of sulfur. So that's how much of the excess reactant is left over. So those are limiting reactant problems. Now, we're going to take another uh, look at how we, we uh, think about reaction stoichiometry and take a look at the concept of percent yield. Now, in a, in a typical experiment in the laboratory, we make a lot of assumptions. We're assuming that all of the reactant will actually react and make product. In the real world, that actually doesn't happen. Very often, there might be a, a reason why a reactant doesn't react. And we actually have a less than 100% yield. And so this calculation here helps us to figure out what the percent yield is. It's actual yield, and that's how much we actually produce in a reaction. We have to, to normally determine that experimentally. The theoretical yield goes in the denominator, and the theoretical yield is the amount of product that we calculate that should be produced in a reaction. And that's normally determined using a stoichiometry problem. So the problems that we've just been working in this uh, last example or in the previous video, we've been calculating theoretical yields in pretty much all of those. Now, we're going to solve and calculate some percent yield values here. So let's say that in an experiment, a chemist calculates that 16.37 grams of calcium carbonate should be produced. However, after the experiment is complete, only 14.08 grams are actually collected. What is the percent yield of this process? Well, it's fairly simple. We just use that same equation that we looked at. We're solving for the percent yield. The actual yield is which of these numbers? Well, it's 14.08 grams. That's how much we actually collected. The theoretical yield is how much we calculate that should be produced, the 16.37 grams. So when we divide this and then multiply by 100, we find that the percent yield is about 86.01%. So that's a fairly straightforward process there. Now, what if we have another type of question? Let's say that we have a certain experimental process that is known to have a 72.0% yield. In order to produce 10.0 grams of the product in the laboratory, the chemist should strive to produce what theoretical yield during the process? So this is an interesting question. If you kind of know what the percent yield is before you even go into the lab, you can actually adjust your, your, your values and get 10 grams. So let's once again plug this into the equation. This time we know what the percent yield is. We know that it's a 72.0% yield. Now this time it says that the actual yield, what we're actually trying to make, is the 10.0 grams. So that goes in the numerator and we're trying to determine what our theoretical yield should be. So we're going to leave that as an x. And we just have an algebra problem here. So now uh, I can divide both sides by 100 and cross multiply. And if I divide both sides by 0.72, I find that I should strive to get a theoretical yield of about 13.9 grams. So if you know the percent yield ahead of time, you can actually uh, work around that and get how much you, you really want to get. Let's try one more example with percent yield. This is a little bit different here. Here we have calcium hydroxide that is made by adding calcium metal to water, as shown in this equation. A student drops a 5.00 gram chunk of solid calcium metal into excess water. After filtering and drying the product, the student finds that 7.76 grams of calcium hydroxide have been recovered. What was the percent yield in this experiment? Well, once again, the very first thing you want to do is balance that equation, because this is not balanced. So when I balance it, now I'm able to start the problem. Now, I might notice that I do have two values given to me here, but one of these, the 7.76 grams of calcium hydroxide, it says it has been recovered. 
So that phrasing there implies that that amount is an actual yield. That's the actual yield of the calcium hydroxide that was made in this process. Does the problem tell me the theoretical yield? Does it tell me how much calcium hydroxide I was supposed to make? Well, it doesn't. All it tells me is I started with a 5.00 gram chunk of calcium. So I'm going to have to go through my three-step stoichiometry process and solve and find out the theoretical yield of calcium hydroxide. So I've got to do some stoichiometry here. I have to start with 5.00 grams of calcium and go through my three-step process to find out how many grams of calcium hydroxide I should have made in this process. So step one is convert to moles. So that means grams on the bottom and one mole on the top. The periodic table tells me that the atomic mass of calcium is about 40.08. So that's the number of grams in a mole of that. So grams are out. Step two is the mole ratio. So calcium is what I'm starting with. So that goes on the bottom. I'm trying to solve for calcium hydroxide. So that goes on the top. And looking at the balanced equation, this seems to be a one to one mole ratio. So put some ones in there. Calcium goes out. And now I want to convert to grams of calcium hydroxide. So one mole needs to go on the bottom and grams on top. And if I use my calculator, I can add up you know, the atomic masses and find that the molar mass of, cal of calcium hydroxide is about 74.10. So now I can take 5.00, divide by 40.08, and times by 74.10. And I find that the theoretical yield is 9.24 grams of calcium hydroxide. So now the problem gave me the actual yield, which was 7.76 grams. I just calculated the theoretical yield, which was 9.24 grams. And so just divide those out and multiply by 100, and I find that the percent yield is 84.0%. So several different ways that we can solve these percent yield problems, or I should say several different ways in which they can be worded. And then, of course, we had those limiting reactant problems in there as well. I hope this video has given you a nice practice for these stoichiometry problems. Hope you've learned something. If so, smash that thumbs up button. In the next video, we're going to find another application of reaction stoichiometry and take a look at solution stoichiometry. So hope you enjoyed the video and hope to see you on that next video as well.